We're going to take a couple of weeks of a break from our series that we've been in Judges. And as I was thinking about what to preach on for these couple of weeks, I couldn't get away from what time of year we're in, what time of year we're coming off of, and what time of year we're entering into. Uh, Because we just ended Advent, the season of Advent, the season of anticipation has just ended. And so now we enter a season of action, a season of doing, of change, of newness. The start of the new year is met with so many new goals and plans and hopes and dreams. This This time of the new year is met with renewed energy, with new resolve to finally change. But the goals we set at this time of year, the energy that we enter the new year with, it quickly and often fades away, right? And we fail to produce the lasting change that we promised ourselves that we were going to do finally this year. And have you ever asked yourself why? Why is that? Why is it so hard for us to change? What is needed for us to truly transform, to truly have our hearts change? What do we need? Is it more willpower? Is it more discipline? Do we need better direction, guidance, training, leadership, someone who has been successful to help teach us? Do we need more accountability? Just tell more people, more people to make sure that you don't fall off, that when your energy falls off, that you don't. Do we need that? What do we need? What causes us to change? And so because we're entering this time of year, this new year, where it's so often for us to commit to change, to make resolutions of change, I thought it would be appropriate for us to look at change according to the Bible. We're going to spend the next two weeks looking at change according to the Bible. What does change look like? Specifically, we're going to look at it from the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. This morning, what we're going to look at is how. How do we change? How do you change? How does change happen according to this passage, according to the Word of God? How are we transformed? How does change work according to this story? And next week, we're going to answer the question, what does true change look like? So this morning, we're going to look at how, and next week, we're going to look at what does true change look like? When we do change, what does that look like? What is that meant to produce in us? So this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 29. And we're going to ask the question, how? How to change? How do you change? How do I change according to this text and according to the Word of God? It's a little long, but I'm going to have you stand, wake you up a little bit, stand for the reading of God's words. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 29. Why do we stand? We talk about this every so often. Not just because it's a tradition, it's because it's paying attention to who's speaking. This is the Word of God speaking. So he's speaking to us, and we stand to give our attention to that word. From John chapter 4, verses 1 through 29. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, or noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as is his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Whatever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. 
Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? This is the word of the Lord. All right, you can be seated. Let me pray. <clears throat> Father, we ask that you would speak powerfully to us now through your word, that your spirit would move and change and shape us according to your word, that the, that the letters, the words would jump off the pages, that we would in fact be changed and transformed by your message this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Our passage is packed. <laughs> John 4, this story is packed full. In fact, John's gospel is known for its depth. One professor of mine said, when you come to John's gospel, you better bring a shovel. No matter how familiar the passage or the text that you're in, there's always more to dig. There's always more depth to go. So with that being said, we're actually not going to have time to focus on all the details and the depth of this passage. We're going to be focusing very specifically on what we talked about earlier, how to change. What does this passage teach us about how to change? So let's set the stage of what we just read. The first thing to see is that Jesus is on a divine appointment. He's on a divine appointment at this well. As we just read, the Jews and Samaritans hated each other. They hated each other for generation after generation after generation. You see, they both thought that they were God's people. God's chosen people. Therefore, they both thought that all the promises of the Old Testament were only for them. Jews were de deemed Samaritans unclean, and therefore is neither religiously acceptable nor socially safe to travel through Samaria. Instead, what Jews would do when they would travel to uh, Galilee is they would cross the Jordan River twice in order to avoid going through Samaria because they were unclean to them and because they hated each other, it wasn't safe. So when we read in verse 4 that it's told that he must go through Samaria, antennas should go up. Light bulbs should go off because Jesus is on a divine appointment at Jacob's well, but the other person who's coming doesn't know. <laughs> doesn't know he scheduled this appointment doesn't know that this is actually why he's there. So who is it that Jesus encounters at the well? Well, according to the title of this text in my Bible, it's the woman of Samaria. And if you are a Jewish man known to this culture, all the warning signs are going off. Caution tape is all around this situation and this interaction. Because first, it's a woman. Jews, Jewish men did not interact with women at all especially in public, and especially if you didn't know them. So strike one. And as we've already said, she's a Samaritan. So whether she's a woman or a man, the Jewish man should not be interacting with her at all or interacting at all with them. So strike two. And lastly, and maybe the most disturbing one, we read that she's there by herself at noon, at the well by herself at noon. But if you go to draw water, you never go at this time of day. You go in the morning. You go in the morning when it's cooler and you can gather what you needed for the day. And no matter what time of day you go, you never go alone. If you're a woman, you never go alone. One, she wouldn't be able to gather everything she needed for herself. And two, it's not safe for her to travel by herself. 
So not only is she a Samaritan woman, which is bad enough, but she's an outcast is what this is telling us. She's an outcast in her own culture, in her own town. For her to make this trip then to the well at this time of day tells us a lot. It tells us that she's desperate. She's not going to the well because a glass of water sounds nice to her. She's going to the well because she's literally dying of thirst. She is desperate for this water. This trip is not simply one of leisure because it was miserable to travel this time of day in the hot climate. It was dangerous to be by yourself. But worst of all, I think, for her is what she'd have to go through as she walks through the town that she's an outcast of. And everyone knows she's by herself, and everyone knows what she's done. And so they hurl insults. They spit on her. They probably throw some rocks at her. The shame, the walk of shame that she has to go through to get to Jacob's well is probably the worst thing she has to go through. Despite the heat, despite the loneliness, the shame that she has to walk through every single time she goes to the well. So you can imagine what emotions are bubbling up in her when she gets to the well and she sees somebody else is there. Not just anybody. Man. The worst interaction, the worst person for her to see when she gets there and all the emotions she has when she thought she would come at this time of day because no one else would be there and she finds someone else is there. Now when they interact, they both have a pattern. Jesus and the woman of Samaria have a pattern that, comes, that goes throughout our text that we can't really dive into. But the pattern is this. Jesus is pursuing her with patience, with care, and with love. In fact, if we were to do a study on how to share the gospel, on how to reach people's heart, on how to love them when they don't want to hear what you have to offer, Jesus gives us a master class here in this text on how to do that. So his pattern is one of patience, care, and love. Her pattern in interaction with Jesus is one of confusion. Confusion and defensiveness and disdain towards this Jewish man at the well at a time where no one else is supposed to be here, where she doesn't want to talk with anyone. And so the entire time of the conversation, she's trying to end it. She's trying to make sure it stops as soon as she can. She throws everything she can at him to try to get it to come to an abrupt halt. She brings up race, she brings up sex, she brings up social barriers, she brings up religious and even moral barriers to try to stop and end this conversation that she doesn't want to have. But everything she throws at Jesus, he isn't phased. He isn't phased even a little bit. In fact, what he does, he lovingly reaches through all those barriers that she throws up at him to reveal to her what he gives and who he is. In verse 10, he tells us that he, that he gives the gift of God. That's the gift of God is what Jesus is there, what he gives, what, what Jesus is offering. And it's this gift of God that breaks through all those barriers. It breaks through all the barriers that she brings up because it's not a wage. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can achieve. It's simply something to be received. And this brings us to our first pause about change in this text, our first point about change in this text, and it's simply this. It's offered to everyone. Everyone is offered the gift of God, which produces change. Nobody's excluded in this. No one and nothing is excluded. Nothing that you have done can disqualify you from receiving the gift of God, no matter your age, no matter what your past has been, no matter what your current struggles or sins are, no matter what your future struggles will be, the doubts that you have about God and his word, the lack of knowledge you may feel you have, the feeling that you should be farther along in your sanctification than you are, no matter what it is, fill in the blank, gospel change is offered to everyone. No one is beyond the reach and the power of, the gift of God that comes from the gospel to change us. There's nothing you must first do to qualify. There's nothing that you can do or have done that would disqualify you. But the woman still doesn't want anything to do with Jesus and what he is offering. As you can tell, he speaks directly to what she perceives to be her need. He whets her appetite, so to say, with what he's offering. He speaks of it as living water. 
And in, in what he's doing, he's showing that this trip, this well that she puts so much trust in, that she depends on so mightily to support her and give her water, he reveals that if you drink of this well, you'll be back because you'll be thirsty again, because you'll need water again. So you'll be back. This well will cause you to thirst again. It may work temporarily, but you'll be back and you'll thirst again. But then he shows that what he's offering her, the living water that he's offering, water is that water that satisfies her soul. That goes deeper than what this water could ever do. That touches our deepest need and her deepest longing. It will satisfy her thirst and she will never be the same as what Jesus is showing her. He points out in verse 13 that whoever drinks the water from the well will thirst again. They will have to make that trip again. But the living water that he offers will satisfy in a way that Jacob's well and the water given will never be able to do. And now, when he presents it that way, now she becomes interested. Now she starts to lean in. She was leaning back, and now she's just leaning in a little bit. This is intriguing. I've never heard of a gift like this before. Now she wants what she thinks he's offering. But all she can think of is, I won't have to make this awful, lonely, and dangerous trip again. So she says in verse 15 in response, give me this water. But she still doesn't get it. She still doesn't understand what he's offering. She still thinks that her need is physical, is outside of her. She doesn't care, and she doesn't care, and she doesn't know who Jesus is at all. She misses what he is offering because she's so consumed with what she thinks that she needs. She thinks she's, he is offering something to quench her physical thirst, which is what she thinks she needs the most right now. But what he is offering is so much more than physical water. It's what she really needs. It's what you and I really need. But that's, she can't hear that. All she can think of is the option, the hope of not having to carry this heavy water jar in this hot climate and this awful trip of walk of shame through the town that she is in where she endures the insults that she has to go through. And while it seems that she wants it, while it seems she's convinced that she needs what he is offering, the only thing on her mind is the trip. It's not Jesus. It's not what he's offering. It's just that trip to the well that she doesn't want to make. But Jesus knows her heart. He knows that she still doesn't understand, that she doesn't get who he is, what he's offering. He knows that she thinks that what she needs is is a break and a reprieve from the difficulty of her life, specifically making that trip to the well. And she doesn't yet understand that what she needs is to be changed from the inside out, that her heart needs to be changed. She thinks her need is something outside of her, is something physical that she can get, but he's after changing her heart. He's not going to satisfy and not settle for just giving her what she thinks she needs. He's going to give her what what she actually needs. See, this water jar and this dreadful trip that she makes over and over again are symbolic pictures in our text. They're symbolic pictures to show us what she is seeking life and meaning from. She is seeking security and meaning and life from these things, and they're symbolic pictures, which is why instead of giving her water when she asked for it, Jesus actually shifts the conversation in verse 16. He shifts it in a way to expose the emptiness of the things that she's looking to for life. He he tells her after she, she says, give me this water, go call your husband and come here. Call your husband and come and then I'll give you the water. And you can feel her response, right? Just as she starts to lean in a little bit and be open to what he might give, he brings up something that causes her to rear back, stiffen up, And give the quick answer, I have no husband, right? Caught in it, completely off guard. Go call my husband. I have no husband. And as she's squirming in her skin, you can sense Jesus' tone starting to soften. As he says, I know. I know you have no husband. I know you've had five. And the one you're sleeping with right now, 
He's not your husband. He's actually someone else's husband. And so now we know why she's alone, right? Now we know why she's the outcast in her town because of what she's done, what she's seeking from these men in her life, why she's an outcast in her society. But we also know that more than just being alone, she's utterly lonely, right? Utterly lonely in her life because what she's gone through is rejection after rejection after emptiness after emptiness, like the trips to the well. Over and over, they didn't work. It didn't satisfy. You see, Jesus is connecting that emptiness of the water that she thinks is going to give her life, that she perceives to be her greatest need with the emptiness of the thing that she's been seeking life from, the thing that she truly worships and just seeks to be changed by. That's the men's love of acceptance. And it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. It's why she's been through five husbands and she's sleeping now with somebody that's not her husband but somebody else's. And now she's exposed for who she is. She's exposed for the, where she looks for meaning and worth and its emptiness. And can you feel what she's going through in this moment? This moment in the conversation, can you feel what she's experiencing? The, the shame and the shock of being exposed from a stranger, another man. The all too familiar fear of being known and then rejected. And is this not us? in some way, shape, or form? Is this not our ultimate fear? That we too will really be exposed for who we really are? And that others or even God will see us to our core? I mean, we all acknowledge we're not perfect, right? But the truth is, is that we try to fool people, including ourselves sometimes, to the extent of our sin. So we hide. So we think that we're alone too right? We hide, and we're good at pretending. We're good at going through the motions. We're good at pretending. New Year's resolutions are a great thing in and of themselves. Whether you do them or not doesn't matter to me, but, but oftentimes, can you not see the types of resolutions that we make? Our perceived need is kind of like this woman. We think it's something outside of us that needs to change. We tend to think that our real problem is not the fact that we constantly worship and look to other things for life and meaning outside of God, but maybe, maybe just that extra weight that we need to lose. Maybe that extra time we need to not spend on our phone so our quality of life is a little better. We need to read the Bible in a year. Good things. These are good things to be sought after, but they kind of nod to the fact that we too don't think our need is as dire as it is to have our hearts change. Don't miss here. Those are good things to be pursued, right? But so often we miss what our true need is like this woman, which is why we often miss the power that is offered to us in his word to change. And like the woman, we are terrified of being known and rejected, not just by others, but by God himself. So the woman changes the subject. She gets exposed. He knows everything about me. She stiffens up again. She moves back. Defensiveness happens again. And she changes the subject, trying to distract. What are the two topics to bring up to make sure conflict and the conversation ends quickly? Religion and politics, right? Nothing's changing that. That's her go-to. That's her bread and butter. That's her Hail Mary, her last resort. He's found out who I am. Let's go to religion. You say this, Jews. We Samaritans say this. This has been why we hate each other for generation after generation, right? So who's right? Who's right? Let's talk about this. Let's, let's take the target off of me and onto something else. And if I were Jesus, I would say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not, we can't shift that quickly to this bomb that just got dropped, right? No, but he doesn't do that. He actually goes with her in those topics, answers her questions. Why? What does that show us? That Jesus is not exposing her to rebuke her, to crush her, to shame her again like all the other men in her life have done. No, he's exposing for a different reason. He's seeking to lovingly reveal to her like a skillful, talented surgeon would do to reveal to her what her problem is. 
so that she can receive and experience the real change and the gift of God that he is offering her. Jesus does not make her sit in her shame, but reveals that he has come for that very reason. That he's come to take it away because he talks about his hour is coming and is now here. And in John's gospel, anytime the word, the hour, or the phrase, the hour is coming, it's pointing to the cross. He's talking about the cross. So he's saying the time is coming, the hour is coming, it's here now. This is why I've come. He's pointing her, he's pointing us to the cross. He's pointing her and us to the gospel, to his grace. And don't miss when he's doing it. It's in the midst of her being exposed for who she is. It's in the midst of her being seen for who she really is. And having her sin put put before her that he tells her this. He tells her that he's the Messiah, that he's the Savior. He shows that he knows her and all of her sin, all the men she's ever been with, and what she's seeking from them that hasn't worked. And rather than condemn her for that, he says, I've come for that reason. I've come to free you from that emptiness. And the question for us is, does it work? Does she receive the gift of God? The living water, the salvation he's offering, does it work? Look at verse 29. The very beginning, what does it say? What does she do? It's almost a throwaway line. So easy to bypass it. What does she do? She drops her water jar. The all-important thing, the thing she's desperate for, the thing that symbolizes what she looks to for meaning, life, and security, that she willingly walked through the town and the shame that she had to go through. Now, what she's there for, she drops it. Why? Because she doesn't thirst anymore. Not the same way that she did before. Because she's filled with his living water that he gives. And so now, what's the water jar in your life? What's the water jar that you're clinging to, that you're holding on to, that you need to drop for Jesus? That's the wrong question. It's so easy for us to go there, though, isn't it? I'm sure you already had answers coming up. You're thinking, or maybe you had a blank, but you tried to answer. So easily, so often we go to what's the water jar in your life that you need to drop for Jesus? If you, this is the place you go right now, you're missing it. You're missing the point and the power of how to change. Because the point is not what's the water jar in your life that you need to drop for Jesus. The point is that once she saw Jesus for who he was, the water jar is no longer an issue. It's a, it's a throwaway verse. It's a throwaway line. Because it's not the focus. That's not the issue. Once she sees Jesus for who he is, the water jar is no longer an issue. She's filled. Her thirst is quenched. What is it that she sees? That she was fully known and truly loved for the first time in her life. That she's known to the depth of who she is and all of her sin, the very reason why everyone else in her town has rejected her, and in some ways, rightfully so. But those things were seen and exposed by Jesus. And rather than rejection, she experiences being filled and loved and embraced. Not in a superficial way as the other men in her life have done. But in a real way that she is known to her depth. And she is loved beyond what she could imagine. This man is the true Savior. This is the love that she's been after this whole time in her life. So how is it possible for her to receive this living water from Jesus rather than be rejected? Because her sin is real. It's not made up. The reason why she's rejected and an outcast in her society is because of how she has wronged people. How she has lived and sinned against others. So how is it possible for her to receive it? How is it possible for you and I to receive this living water, this gift of God, to break through all the barriers? How do we know that our barrier is not higher than the others and in some ways keeps it out? 
How can Jesus reach through the barriers to fill us with living water so that we will never thirst? How do we know that his love is for us even when he knows the extent of our sin? Remember, there are two people that came to the well. And we're told at the beginning that Jesus came because he was weary. He's on a journey. He was tired. He was thirsty. But only one person gets filled. Only the woman gets her thirst quenched at this well. You know, there's only one other time in the book of John where we're told it's the sixth hour other than this text. The sixth hour that's noon. You guess where that is? It's the beginning of Jesus' hour. The beginning of the cross. And it's there. The last words he has on the cross in John's gospel. The last words that he says, I thirst. He says, I thirst. So how can you and I know that we can receive and be filled with the living water, the gift of God in our salvation in spite of our sins? How can we know that the thirst of our soul can be quenched? It's because on the cross, Jesus took our thirst. He took our thirst by drinking the full cup of God's wrath. And don't miss this, guys. This is what I want us to get. Notice that Jesus did not offer her living water on the basis of her changing. He didn't say, I'll give you living water. You just need to stop with all these men. You need to stop looking to them. Stop being with this guy who's not your husband. You, I, I have something greater to give you. I have what you're looking for. Just stop with these. He doesn't do it on the basis of that. But it's his offer of living water in the midst of her sin that causes her to change. That causes her to drop the water jar that's symbolic of all the men. She changes, yes, but don't miss the order. Not because she promised to do so, but because she was filled by the living water that he had to give her in the midst of her sin. Next week, we're going to look at what that change looks like what that actually practically looks like. But for now, answer the question, how do we change? How to change? How does change happen? It's when we experience God's grace towards us, specifically in our sin. No one's calling sin good. No one's saying what this woman has done is good. But all of us sin. And all of us need to experience God's grace when we do. And when we experience it, that, that's how we change. That's how change happens, according to John chapter 4. We change when we see and experience the love and grace of God found in Jesus. We change and we grow as we see the extent to which his love actually reaches. Because what's going to happen tomorrow? You're going to sin again. And as you sin again, let that be a reminder of the depth of his love. Any sin you have, all the sin you have, the the sin that you try to hide, bring it to him. Bring it to him, and that's when you'll experience his loving embrace of change. In John 7, it says, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And that's the exhortation. Bring your thirst to Jesus. He stands up. He cries out. It's this offer. Come. Again, no qualification. No stipulation put on it. Come if. Come when. No, come. Everyone who thirsts, bring your thirst to him. Come and drink. He doesn't say, come and give me your dirty bucket of water of good deeds. He says, come with your thirst, your need, your emptiness to come and drink. And that's it. That's how you change. That's the question. That's the answer to the question how to change. You drink in the grace of Jesus by seeing that on the cross, he willingly took your thirst by drinking the full cup of God's wrath for you. John, who on the cross thirsted for his father's deliverance, but instead, God is Father's wrath and judgment so that we will never thirst 
again. Amen.